Hey, it's Enigma Hood. Uh, I've been planning on making this video for a long time and I just kept on putting it off. Um, I promised my fiance that I would make this video and I just, you know, I kept putting it off. I wanted to make it in a very organized and, and professional manner, similar to my general relativity video, but I thought, you know, I should just, I should just make the video finally and, you know, stop putting it off and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read some bullet points and then just talk about uh, the various aspects of special relativity off the top of my head and uh, without having any screening written out you know so hopefully it won't be a complete disaster but uh, it definitely is not uh, the best way of conveying information so I apologize for that but you know let's just get started I guess uh, okay, well, the first one is uh, the mass energy equivalence, which is E equals mc squared. Well, what does that mean? It means that energy and mass are equivalent, and you can convert one to the other. You can create mass with energy, and you can create energy with mass. It's a lot easier to create energy with mass, but uh, uh, you can do it the opposite way as well. Um, so basically, any object in the world has its equivalent in energy. And uh, that, uh, I don't know the, the joules, but I know what the equivalent is in uh, explosive power, if it were to all be released at once. Uh, if you have a gram of matter, it would release about as, it would l release more energy than what was released in Nagasaki, a little bit more. Uh, Nagasaki, uh, the, the, bo the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, the Fat Man bomb, that released about 20 kilotons of TNT, the equivalent. And, um... Uh, one gram would release uh, about 23 kilotons of TNT, so it's a little bit more if, if you were to convert one gram of uh, matter into its equivalent in energy and assume that there's no losses to neutrinos or anything like that, but that's, that's a different topic. Anyway, yeah, so that's basically what it means. So it, there's a conservation of energy, not a conservation of mass. Uh, you can, in fact, destroy matter with antimatter, and there's other ways too, like using black holes, and there's certain uh, extrapolations of the Grand Unified Theory that suggest that protons de can decay, and you can catalyze de that decay with uh, magnetic monopoles, which are theoretical objects. We don't even know if they exist, but if they do, they should catalyze proton decay. But anyway, uh, let's, let's keep moving on. Okay, lack of an absolute reference frame. Basically what that means is that every, everything is relative to something else when things are moving. Here on Earth, everything is relative, relative to the ground, so it's easy to tell if something's moving or not. But in outer space, things are relative to what? There is no absolute reference frame to compare things, so you have to choose something, and whatever you choose is arbitrary. Uh, usually we might choose our our planet, Earth, uh, but uh, maybe it might make more sense to say something is moving relative to our solar system, you know, something like that. And uh, so what that means is that uh, actually it doesn't matter what is moving, you know, if you have a rocket ship blasting off uh, deep into outer space, you could say that uh, the rocket ship is actually stationary, and it's our planet that's moving away from it. You could say that, because everything is relative, so you can, whatever you choose as your reference frame is arbitrary. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's a very uh, interesting thing when you think about it. But it's true. Things are relative to each other. So, if, some, if a rocket ship's traveling at 99% traveling at the speed of light relative to the Earth, you could say that the rocket ship's stationary and it's our planet that's moving at 99% the speed of light uh, in reference to the spaceship, the rocket ship. Okay, what else? Mm, okay, time dilation. As you move closer to the speed of light, time dilates. It, it becomes slower for you. And what that means is that you could conceivably travel into the future relative to our planet. And uh, so you could travel hundreds of years, thousands of years, millions, even billions of years into the future. And uh, for you, you know, time is slowed down, so, you know, you could only 
a few minutes could have passed for you. Whereas on Earth, you know, millions or billions of years could, could have passed. So you can, in fact, travel into the future with this phenomenon called time dilation. Of course, the big question is, can you travel backwards in time? And that's a little harder to do. Uh, it, it, it's possible there's some uh, theoretical ideas using either black holes or using uh, wormholes to do it. And uh, maybe I might, I might come back to that later, but let's move on for now. Uh, length contraction. Uh, basically, if you have two, like, uh, two measuring sticks, let's say that they are a meter long, and one is at rest and one is in a rocket ship moving at 99% of percent the speed of light, that measuring stick will actually shrink. It will contract uh, with respect to you on planet Earth. That's just uh, it's similar to the time dilation thing. It's weird like that. <laughs> anyway, what else? Okay. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Or I should say more correctly, nothing can accelerate to the speed of light. You can get infinitely close to the speed of light. You can go 99.9999999 and you know, just have an infinite number of nines. But uh, you can never reach 100% the speed of light. And the reason is because in order to do that, you would have to have an infinite, number, infinite amount of energy to do it. And of course, that's impossible. You know, it also brings up an interesting uh, consequence of that. That means that potentially you could have as much energy, kinetic energy, imparted to it to a moving object as you want. So theoretically, you could have like a, a bullet. You know, a, a bullet that you would normally have in like a handgun or something, and it would have enough kinetic energy to destroy our planet. You know, it's just going at such a huge uh, fraction of the speed of light. It's possible. Um, that's why, and there's like a, a thing called a relativistic uh, bomb. Basically, it's just a slug of matter traveling close to the speed of light, doing tremendous amounts of damage when it impacts a planet. Uh, that's a, a theoretical weapon, you know. They call those relativistic bombs. Uh, yeah. So, um, but while it's impossible for something to accelerate to the speed of light. There are, there's technically nothing in physics that disobeys particles from moving faster than the speed of light already. You know, if that makes any sense. You know, they, they postulate, or I should say they, they hypothesize these particles. They call them tachyons, and they say that, you know, if these things exist, they already are moving faster than the speed of light. And this is just in their natural state. Uh, they could exist. Is there anything else that kind of exhibits faster than light behavior? Well, yeah. Um, particles, like electrons or even protons or, or, and things like that, they uh, exhibit this, um, this property where you can't ever know for certain the exact uh, momentum and position of a particle. You can know one, but you can't know the other, and they call that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the reason is because these particles are constantly disappearing and reappearing in reality. You know, they disappear out of reality, reality and then they reappear in another position in reality. And that's why, you know, if you ever studied chemistry or physics, uh, there is no, like, um, <clears throat> uh, well-defined orbits for electrons around a around the nucleus of an atom, it's uh, a probability cloud, right? It there's a probability that it might exist somewhere in the cloud, this one electron, and in fact, it's like appearing simultaneously in all of these positions at once. You know, how is it doing this? It's teleporting in and out of reality, and that's exhibiting some kind of weird, faster than light behavior. And sometimes these um, these particles, the electrons or protons, uh, can actually tunnel through. That means teleport through a physical barrier and reappear on the other side. And this is actually what allows nuclear fusion at the core of our sun to occur. It turns out that the intense heat and pressure at the core of our sun is not sufficient enough to allow uh, 
hydrogen nuclei close enough for them to fuse. What's allowing them to fuse is the fact that they're really getting close, but they're, they're tunneling, they're quantum tunneling through that barrier, that electromagnetic barrier, so they appear on the other side, and then they get close enough, the proton gets close enough to the other nuclei, and then they can fuse. And it's, it's like teleportation, and it's really weird. And it, I would say that that's an example of some kind of faster than like behavior. It's really odd. But it's true. Um, anything else uh, has faster than faster than light behavior? Uh, the expansion of the universe. Uh, apparently, the universe is expanding at a rate that is faster than light. Um, there's something called t quantum teleportation, uh, where two particles, when they're superimposed upon each other, like electron, two electrons, um, they will become entangled with each other, and then they will have a uh, properties like the spin like one can be they'll constantly be uh, swip, uh, sw swapping back and forth between spin up and spin down for example and uh, they will continue to be swapping between these two spin states and you can separate the two particles and put them on opposite, opposite sides of the universe and then if you just examine one that's enough to detangle the two particles and then they will rest they will collapse into a rest state where one will be in spin up and the other one on the other side of the universe will be in the exact opposite state so it will be in spin down and this is something that occurs simultaneously and happens faster than the speed of light so it's a an interesting and weird phenomenon anything else uh... well um... there is uh, you know wormholes the possibility of uh, these objects that are theorized to exist wormholes where they essentially take you know the fabric of space-time and they fold it and then they have this little tunnel through uh, and it allows this passage passageway through the space-time and allows you to uh, reappear on another side of the, the universe without uh, actually traveling all that great distance and, you know if I use an analogy you know imagine you have two tall buildings and like you're on the top floor of this building and then you're on you want to get to the top floor of this building well normally you have to you know go all the way down cross the street then go all the way up take the elevator all the way up well the, the, the wormhole so to speak would be like you putting like a ladder between the two so that you can cross directly into uh, the, the, the top building the top floor of the other building. Uh, yeah, so that's something that exhibits faster than light behavior, although uh, relativity is not being violated locally at any time. Okay, anything else I want to talk about? Mm, not really. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. Didn't I say I wanted to come back to something? What did I want to come back to? Oh yeah, uh, traveling through time. Is it possible to travel backwards in time? Well, using the same wormhole idea, it is actually possible. Um, I hope I can remember this correctly. Uh, you know, the, the way the wormhole works is that you can enter one mouth and then you'll appear on, on the other mouth, in, in the other mouth, come out on the other <laughs> side. Um, how does this work? Okay. Imagine that it's the year 2000, right? And then you send one mouth and you accelerate, you accelerate it close to the speed of light so that time dilates for it. And then 10 years pass for this mouth, right? So it's 2010, it reads on this mouth. But time dilated for the accelerated mouth so that when it comes back, only five years have passed. So if we had a clock on each mouth, this would say 2010, and this would say 2005 or 2005. <sighs> Let me see how this is work. Okay. Even though the, the, time, the time dilated for the accelerated mouth, uh, these two mouths are supposed to be synchronized. So if you were to enter in this mouth the, 20, the the mouth that says 2005 the accelerated one you should come out 
at a time 